Last week we talked about the universe and our place within it. This week we discuss the exploration of Mars, a specific part of the universe. Some consider it the next step in humanity's exploration. This is What Really Matters with Tyler and Matthew on KOWL 1490 The Owl, Tahoe's Talk. Tyler is on call today. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm, on, I'm on the phone, basically. Uh, my audio isn't going to sound as good as it normally does, but, you know, it's unavoidable. I'm here, <laughs> at least. It's fine, you'll you'll steer, still hear him. Anyway, I think what's important about discussing the exploration of Mars is that it it really excites us more than uh, well it's really the most exciting science fiction concept of our uh, that we can really experience within our lifetime right lifetimes. exactly i mean I, I think the importance of going to mars can be surmised by going back to the first moon landing you know the time before that the the feeling of adventure and sort of scientific unity that the united states had and i'm sure that russia kind of had i'm not sure what their situation was like over there but just the race to get to space was this time of great technological improvement and advancement trying to gather the technologies that would let us get to the moon. I mean, we experienced a lot of scientific growth in that time, and it it excited us as a culture, and it brought us closer together. And I think that's that's kind of what's so very important about. And I I think it would make sense for it to bring us together because it's so interesting personally. It almost has some sway in people's personal lives when they when they stop and consider their place in the universe and they realize that we're just on one planet and there are other planets out there that we could possibly explore. Right. And I I've often I've often heard where we were born too late to explore the earth, too early to explore the stars, but what's often forgotten is that we were born just right in time to explore Mars. Well, Right in time for some people to explore yeah. Mars. Of course, I don't expect any mass colonization anytime soon, but I think we can talk about some uh, currently planned or speculated about missions to Mars within the next few decades. Yeah, and I think it's also important to say that the, the spirit of exploration has always been with humanity. You know, if you go all the way back to, you know, especially with that older Dodge born too late to explore the world, right? We we have always wanted to explore, and there was a lure to the new world as well. You know, just as there is a lure to Mars and a lure to the moon. Uh, and I, th- I think that that displays the cultural significance of having somewhere to go. But, you know, yeah, continue from where you go. Well, there's basically, there's a few companies and government organizations that will be the first ones to go to Mars. And what comes to mind, of course, is NASA. The, which is the United States organization, which is responsible for going to space. Right, of course. And then there's the European Space Agency. There's the, the Chinese Space Agency. I, I think Russia has one as well. And what's interesting, though, is that those are government organizations, but also there's a private organization called SpaceX, which plans to go to Mars. And yeah. even though it's a private organization and has less funding than uh, the NASA and European Space Agency, it might actually be the first one to reach Mars because of, of its model. It, it's, it's driving mission right, is right, to right. colonize well, I mean, Mars. Let's, let, let's, let's explain what SpaceX is first to the people who have been you know, living under a rock and don't know what SpaceX is. It's, it's, a, it's a company that's headed currently by CEO uh, Elon Musk and... It's um, it, it's it's been built up sort of from the ground. Elon just uh, built up SpaceX, and over the last few years, um, after a lot of trials and tribulations and failed launches, they finally got a rocket up. And ever since they got that first rocket up, they've been on the rise. You know, um, they they have the cheapest uh, space flights that have ever been achieved. You know, they they are. I- I think to give some sense of a timeline, the company was founded in 2002, but it took them until 2008 to launch their Falcon 1 rocket, which was the first rocket that uh, was able to successfully launch orbit and um, and orbit the Earth. So uh, it's it's it took them six years from founding to rocket, and then again two years for a company to send a, a spacecraft to the ISS. And just recently, last year, they were able to land a rocket on on a, a barge on the ocean yeah which by the way that i mean that can't be glossed over that's insane i'm sure people uh who are listening probably know what a space launch kind of looks like you know the stage separations where that one's where that one end bit falls off from the spacecraft and the rest keeps going 
they landed that bit, that big s- cylinder of metal and, you know, and valves, they landed that on a barge. Like, that is an insane accomplishment. It, there were a lot of people saying it couldn't be done at the time. Well, it really, and, it really highlights the precision we've got to, that we can put rockets into very specific configurations as it's going down. But more yeah. importantly than just the precision that rockets have now is is the fact that it was able to do it autonomously and... It was it was the fact that it was a reusable rocket, meaning that we could just right. keep sending it back up and down, and it would just keep doing its thing uh, automatically, which which saves a lot yeah. of money in so, the long run because they don't have to keep building new rockets; they can just reuse the old ones. And uh, that's that's SpaceX. When when we're talking about SpaceX, we're talking about a company that's accomplished quite a bit under a, a, a very. Uh, Im- in my view, a very impressive CEO. Uh, right, and and I think it, it's it's the CEO, of course. Elon Musk has a has a strong vision to colonize Mars, but there are some reasons why the company itself has been able to do more with the lower amount of money that it has. And one of the reasons is that when they're building engines, for example, for their rockets, they have a they have like um. They have a private interest model of building an engine. They make assembly lines so that they can make the engines quicker and more efficiently. Whereas with NASA, and I'm, I'm sure they have some efficiency protocols, but it takes them a lot more money to uh, try to mass produce the types of products that SpaceX is able to do on a daily basis. So it almost makes yeah. SpaceX money go a lot further than money from NASA or the European Space Agency. Well, I think uh, in in terms of SpaceX, and we'll we'll stop talking about SpaceX in a little bit here and get back to Mars. But uh, I think with uh, SpaceX, you can also point to uh, the CEO Elon Musk as actually being a, a driving force of of the company. I mean, if you look at any of the companies he's founded, uh, Tesla, SpaceX, obviously, um, the new solar company he just bought. I don't know the name, um, but th- they are all sort of with the. They're all bought, at least as Elon Musk has said about himself, that he he wants to help humanity with what he's doing. He wants to make uh, sustainable cars. He wants to take us to Mars, and he wants our energy to be cleaner. So I think a lot of the enthusiasm that is seen out of SpaceX can really be directly tied to Tesla, I think. I mean, (laughs) can be tied to Elon Musk. And yes, so Elon Musk has a very narrow focus, too, because NASA, of course, has a goal to study our climate. And not all, I mean, almost none of the probes that they send are directly to Mars or even for the purpose of uh, colonizing other planets. So it makes sense that this private company, if it just has one goal, then it will be able to achieve the goal. But I think, as you said, I think we should move from SpaceX to talking about Mars. And the reasons yeah. uh, it's important to know about SpaceX w- in this discussion, but now we're, we're yes, you could on. imagine a company doing this, uh, what we're about to talk about. And so, mm. uh, as I said in the last episode, Mars is the closest uh, Earth like planet, and but it's not really Earth like, it's 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 similar to Earth in some ways, but radically different in others. Whereas, whereas most right. planets in the solar system are just radically different to earth and have no similar redeeming factors but mars is mars is yeah, a bit different. i think when when uh, yeah i think when when some people view mars in their head they don't think of mars as inhospitable as it really is because we we hear a lot we hear a lot um just about when we're talking about the colonization of mars we hear a lot about building space bases there and everyone, you know, going around and growing off the Martian soil, things like that. But often science fiction and people will gloss over how different these two are, so right? I, I, I mean, guess Mars I should, is extraordinarily I explain cool. some of the uh, similarities and then go into some of the differences. So oh, the, the fair, similarities fair. with Earth, uh, it's it's just a third the size, and so the gravity is uh, is reasonable. You could walk on it without feeling like you're weightless. And the polar ice, it has polar ice caps just like Earth does, and it has water, so that you could, in principle, melt the water and drink it. And it has some running water, as I went into last episode. And it has uh, basic terrestrial features that Earth does. For example, it has mountains, valleys, um, and it used to have oceans as well, which um, is is related to the fact that it might currently have life there. 
uh, or it might not have life there and might have previously had life and then it just died away when the oceans evaporated. Um, it's 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 uh, axial tilt, which is just you know how tilted it is on its axis, is pretty similar to Earth. So its seasons are pretty similar to Earth's seasons, even though they last twice as long because the Martian year is about 1.8 Earth years. And it, so it wouldn't feel that much different than Earth as well. The days on Mars are called souls, and they're slightly uh, I th- I think they're slightly longer than. Uh, earth days but it's not much yeah they're about 30 minutes longer than an earth day. but it, it's it, it's still uh it was within reason to well it's it's still within kind of the margin of error of people's circadian rhythm so it shouldn't make that much of a difference on our biological yeah. systems whether people are sleeping on mars so when, i mean when you hear that you think oh okay mars mars is pretty hospitable with with a little with a little ingenuity we can probably uh you know, land there and make a make a colony, but that glosses over the vast differences between Mars and Earth. I mean, there's extremely hostile conditions. I mean, we were talking about how the gravity is similar; it's workable, but it is definitely not the same. Uh, the gravity of Mars is about 38 percent that of Earth, um, and we don't know what sort of effects that would have on humans. And it's a lot colder. Well, not than, a, um, the temperature. Not only that, well, the gravity is a lot smaller. Uh, but it's that kind of exacerbates the problem of the atmosphere because the atmospheric pressure on low, right. on Mars is so low; it's less than one percent of the Earth atmospheric pressure. Which means that even yeah. if you tried to terraform the planet, which we might get into later, which means changing the planet's atmosphere to make it hospitable, hospitable to humans, even if the entire atmosphere was made of oxygen that humans could breathe, we probably still wouldn't want to breathe it because it would be so hard to get the oxygen into our lungs because of the low atmospheric pressure. It would almost be like you're going into the stratosphere on Earth. Even if there's oxygen in the stratosphere, you, you still wouldn't want to breathe. Yeah. And, I mean, we you have to mention how cold Mars is. I mean, it's basically, it's analogous to uh, Antarctica, you know? It goes anywhere from uh, 23 degrees Fahrenheit to negative 125. And that's that's sort of, that's that's just the mean temperature. I mean, it can get a lot colder than that. And negative five degrees Celsius and negative eighty-seven. If you're, you know, <laughs> Celsius. Yeah, right. Well, I guess maybe we should be advocating Celsius. We do want to. <laughs> yeah, I, I I read Celsius, so it was a little weird for me to read that Fahrenheit there. But you know. <laughs> so I think now that we've discussed the differences and similarities of Mars, I think maybe we should go into the phys- philosophical reasons why people want to go to Mars. It's not just the fact yeah, that they want I'm, to live there. Because, as I mean, obviously, they could just live on Earth. But it's also the fact that we would want to continue our um, exploration, as we've gone into. But, for example, some scientists, such as Stephen Hawking, have said we shouldn't put all of our eggs in one basket. Meaning that we should have humans spread out across the solar system. We should have humans on Earth. And we should have humans on Mars, so that if there's some ecological catastrophe on either of the planets, then there's still humans on the other one. Right. I see. I don't know if I. I don't know if I agree with that. With that view, though, and I. I, I sort of want to get into the idea that maybe we shouldn't colonize Mars as a backup plan because I mean it is really inhospitable. It's more inhospitable than any place we have ever tried to colonize in our history. I mean. It's nine. The atmosphere is ninety-five percent carbon dioxide. All right, that is really bad for humans. You know, so I think maybe we shouldn't view Mars as this place where we can go if we mess up on Earth. I think maybe we're all making an excuse because we actually just want to explore. And I, I think maybe I, you know? I should point out before we go into that just the need to explore. I think when people when people discuss uh, having Mars as a backup planet, they often think of, oh, maybe if climate change gets too bad, then we can go to Mars. But as we've discussed, the climate on Mars is far worse than Earth. And there is almost no situation yeah. in which climate change would possibly uh, be as bad as Mars on Earth. That would be the uh, the ultimate catastrophe on Earth if that <laughs> if that happened, but it's not going to happen. <laughs> 
But yeah. the type of I mean, well, unless Earth gets hit by an asteroid, we're not going to be yes, the same state as Mars, and it would need to be a size. That's what I was asteroid. going to bring up. The only thing that could possibly, uh, in my book, cat- count as a catastrophe that in which a Mars backup would be useful is a type of asteroid uh, collision on on the scale of the the dinosaur uh, collision sixty five million years ago. Um, anything anything less than that and it probably wouldn't be that worth it because there would just be surviving humans on earth anyway this is what really matters with tyler and matthew on kowl 1490 the owl tahoe's talk basically the idea that we're using mars as a backup planet is really doesn't hold that much water in my opinion i think in your opinion yes i think really the reason that we keep making these reasons to go to mars is because I think we all just want to get there, you know? Uh, there's this there's this innate human tendency where we want to explore and learn and discover. We're curious. I mean, that is innate in humans. Every human being is curious, you know? And I, I say that with absolute And confidence. so this, I guess maybe and, I should briefly explain the other side of the argument then, because a lot of times when this gets brought up, uh, when people have exhausted the arguments about why we should go to Mars, and it eventually just comes down to innate curiosity, like you've been saying, some people like to bring up the fact that the moon landings were very pointless, uh, in the fa- in the sense that they didn't provide the United States anything. They didn't, pr- well, in this sense, they didn't provide the United well, States anything. Well, you know money. what? I think, I think that they're, they're right. It probably didn't provide that much money, but what it did provide was incredible technological advancement. I mean, prov- if you yes. look at a list of the things that were developed in during the space race b- directly because of the fact we and wanted to those are to land those are NASA's. I mean, it's insane. Velcro, yeah, it- yeah. I'm Velcro space pens, obviously. I mean, all these all these inventions that you know are still in use today. I mean, it, you can go home and look up a list. It's really quite impressive. It, It was a massive boom in technology. Although, once again, I would like to point out that that argument could be dismissed uh, in a sense that we could have spent the money developing those technologies and not gone to the moon, right? So it's it's not the fact that we develop the technologies. What you need to justify if you're talking about going to Mars and uh, colonizing Mars is just the fact that it's cool. And to do such a thing as that needs no other justification other than the fact that we innately want to explore and other than the fact that uh that we just like going to places that we've never gone yeah uh, you know i would say maybe maybe we don't need a justification w- w- bigger than that one i mean you need something to capture the public's imagination if you want to keep doing science and right? and i think i think even then uh the public imagination was sure captured in the moon landing but it would be even it would be a greater capture in the mars landing because of the differences between the two missions the moon was just landed on and then the astronauts came back mars has the potential to have a colony in which using our modern technology we could live stream the entire colony and we could see what's happening on Mars in a way that wasn't possible with the moon landing. Right, exactly, exactly. I, I think we we really should go to Mars. That's always that's always been my view. That's that's what I think. Because I mean if you if you look at the public conversation right now, people aren't really talking about science that much. People don't really care about, you know, the, the, about space exploration or anything like that. I mean, besides people who are already interested in it, the average public person probably doesn't give many thoughts as to whether Mars will be colonized, you know? Well, I but kind, I kind of you... agree with you there. I think, uh, I don't know whether this would cause a revolution in science. I think it would inspire many young people to go into scientific fields. But more than that, um, it, it would kind of move us on in our in our ultimate journey to explore throughout the universe, which is, uh, I mean, that's really thinking long term. But if you think about it, having a having a Mars colony is just one step toward having interstellar interstellar colonies, for example. Right. And eventually, uh, I think if people realize that a Mars colony was possible, we would just keep pushing the boundaries. We would say, what other planets can we colonize? Exactly. And, and I think so. I might bring up that. Venus could possibly be colonized. I did. I, I talked about last episode how it was so inhospitable because of the atmosphere and how hot it was there. Right. But, but it's possible for us to send a colony to Venus 
and have them float through the atmosphere. In in fact, the atmosphere is so thick that it wouldn't be that hard to have a, a kind of a hot air balloon in which people, or, or a blimp, in which people could um, float around the atmosphere of Venus. And and exactly. by then, it like kind a, of... Like a cloud city sort of thing. If, if, the, if that mission was bolstered by our previous mission to Mars, we could be a tri-planet uh, society. We would exist on three planets. And the implications of that uh, it's 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 kind of uh, incredible for all of our history. We've only existed on one planet, and the idea that in just a decade or two we could be on three, uh, it really speaks to the possibilities of the future. Right, right, yeah. Uh, I, I mean, of course, there's there's always the argument that uh, Mars is you know so inhospitable. It's so expensive. That's nothing like the moon landing. You. You want to station people there. You want people to live on Mars for an extended period of time. That is not cheap. That's not something you can just throw away. And I would say that's true, but it's also not the same in the public conscience. You know? I I mean, landing on the moon, like you said, was pretty impressive. Yeah. Um, Yes, I, I agree. But picture having people on mars where you can look up at the stars and say there's someone out there and they're living humanity is out there and and by the way if you're interested you can do this uh right now but it's it's more limited you can look up and see the iss on some nights there's an iss tracker i'm sure on the internet and you can uh, look up and say, hey, there are people living up there. But the ISS doesn't really capture people's imaginations as no, much because as a Mars not, would. Yeah, they're not on the floor. They're not standing there with a flag in the ground with their own two feet planted, eating, uh, living, breathing on Mars. It, I mean, And I, I think maybe uh, we have discussed, uh, I mean, how great it would be to go to Mars. And... I think, though, we should we should just talk a little bit uh, before this episode ends about the difficulties in going to Mars psychologically. I, I mean, right. of course, there's there's mission difficulties and there's so many technical details that I don't think we could go on to, in, into all of the technical uh, uh, difficulties well, about the mission. But psychologically, uh, we don't really know what could happen. For, for example, um, it takes eight months or uh, it depends uh, on how fast the rocket is, but it takes from anywhere from three to... 18 months to get from Mars. And so this crew needs to be able to live together for that amount of months. And to me, that sounds reasonable to live together. But not only will they have to live together for just the mission to Mars, but they'll have to live there the entire time the colony is at Mars and, of course, the return trip. And whether people can stay sane and uh, respectful to each other for a mission of that duration uh, might jeopardize the mission itself. Right, right. Uh, I mean, I think in later episodes we can probably get it, get into stuff like that because we're really starting to run out of time on this one. But yeah, I, I, I see, I see what you mean. If if those people are, if if they're in the the desolation and basic silence of space, right, with these people for that many months, and then they land. I mean, even with just a year long trip. We really don't know what the ramifications of that are. I mean, they're, I mean, consider they're away from nature itself, you know, the, the, they, everything. Yes, they have no source to entertain themselves except each other. Depending on the mission itself, um, the, it could either be a one-way trip or a two-way trip. And if it was a one-way trip, then they would have to start a, a, almost a nation on Mars because it would they would live their entire lives there. And it... If more trips keep coming, then it would be like they're starting a new society on Mars, and yeah. the type of uh, the type of governance that we'd have over them, the type of sovereignty they would have, that's that's something to be explored entirely on its own. That's uh, yeah. <laughs> to discuss everything about that would take uh, more time than we have. I, I think actually that'd be uh, that might be something to be discussed in the next episode. I don't know, you know. <laughs> well, I guess uh, yeah. this has been what really matters yeah. with Tyler and Matthew on KOWL 1490 VL. Tahoe's Talk. Goodbye. <laughs>